I think it's working. All right, well, let's go. So, uh, so hi everyone. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your virtual start party for August 18th, 2013. I have to che check the date. I should know that it's August 18th. Uh, yeah, so uh, we're going to be hooking up a whole bunch of telescopes, three, to a live Google Plus Hangout on air, and we will showcase the night sky. Whatever's up is up, and we will uh, we will find it. We will take requests, and we will buzz through a bunch of objects that we're going to see in this nice summer sky. Uh, sorry to the uh, to the folks in the uh, on the eastern side of the uh, of North America. The fact that it's like after midnight for you guys, but uh, we should be able to start earlier next week because now the seasons are starting to bring this the VSP back in your favor. So, uh, so that's so I think this is going to be good. Um, so a couple of uh, things. One, just if you want, you can always comment, make any questions. Someone, I think I'm going to mute Stuart. It's probably best. Um, yeah, so we can uh, so you can always give us requests, make any comments, questions, feedback while we're doing the show. Uh, you can make your comments on uh, on the event page, on just in Google Plus if you're watching this on my stream. The safest place is on YouTube, so if you want, just click on uh, YouTube to watch it on YouTube, and then go to YouTube and then make your comment there. Um, and while you're at YouTube, just go ahead and subscribe to the channel wherever it is. Uh, that would be great. So, uh, great. So, joining me tonight, oh, we've got uh, David Dickinson, who is got clouded out, so he's going to bring just the knowledge. You're going to drop some knowledge. Yep, I'm here, coming here from tomorrow. Coming here from tomorrow, the future. <laughs> it's Monday here. Future Dave. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's August 19th for you. All right. We've got Gary Ganella, who's got nice clear skies in the uh, Los Angeles hey, area. Everybody. Hey, Gary. Uh, we got Mark Barron, who we haven't seen in a while, and you've got everybody. nice clear skies in the Chicago area. For once, Which, yes. How do you even know when you have clear skies? Um, well, tonight it's easy because I can see the moon. Oh, really? Okay, that makes sense. Uh, someone was someone was asking me for the meteors. They were like, "Well, uh, you know, I live in Chicago. Where can I go to get some nice dark skies to see the meteor meteors?" And I like brought up the dark sky map, and I had to keep ways. looking. Like yeah. you were looking at like a yeah. two-hour drive to get. Uh, I drove out to uh, Crystal Lake, McHenry County area, which is about an hour outside of where I live, which is just outside of the suburbs. Uh, so it was it was an hour just to go see some meteorites. But that's like and, my and that still backyard. wasn't very dark. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like for you to get like I don't know, you know the dark sky map I'm talking about, right? Yeah, what do you yeah. what can you get to at that? Like green? I live in a white zone. Yeah. So of course. like to get to get to a green zone, that's like you know the best I can hope for with like <laughs> a two hour drive. You know, so, ye yellow green border is about an hour drive for me. And I live in a green zone, just like my backyard in, is a green zone. We're we're a green zone here outside of Tampa too. So. Yeah, oh, I hate you guys. About a, yeah, and then a, and then black is is a half hour drive. Yeah. I have I have property that sits on blue up in northern Maine. If I ever get the money to build a house. <laughs> that sounds great. A couple weeks ago, uh, I went with camping with my astronomy club in an area that's uh, a very it's a dark green zone it's not it, it's solid in a green zone and I, I thought those guys were fantastic so I hate <laughs> you guys for having yeah. you know darker zones than that Anytime you want, you're totally welcome. Come visit. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, and uh, so if we don't know what we're talking about, this is the dark sky dark sky finder. If you go there, look at your uh, if you, you put in your your location on Google Maps and it'll show you what the different skies, how much light pollution you've got, there's, and it's a real eye-opening thing. Just like, ugh, the light pollution is is terrible for huge chunks. The whole east of the United States is just a train wreck. There's a website that's called Clear Sky Chart. It used to be called the Clear Sky Clock, that uh, shows uh, the light pollution maps in addition to showing what the sky conditions are going to be for the night. That's one I've used quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. So, so check that out. Get get used to it. Um, okay. And then the last person to mention is Stuart Foreman. Hey, Stuart. Hello. How are you? Good. I had to mute you. There was some background noise, but I don't want yeah, to because no, I really no, love no, the crickets. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. I tend to move around a lot with what I'm doing, and I I'm a heavy breather, so mute me all you like. Okay. Um, so just to sort of let people know what gear we're using. So Gary, can you just let people know what your telescope is? Uh, it's a Celestron 14-inch uh, Schmidt Cassegrain, and I've got the camera up at the front, so it's uh, running at an f1.9, so it's a 12-inch reflector running at f1.9. That's uh, great. I thought I had it it's up like here. like a hyperstar setup. Yeah, yeah where's... Um, 
caught me off guard. I was going to have it to uh, show him. Well, I'll bring. I'll come back to you in a second here. Okay. <clears throat> and then Mark. Oh, look at this. Speaking of, so you, so you get this this light pollution, and then you get this stupid thing in the sky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, it's still a good view of it. Um, I've got a uh, basically the same thing Gary has, except for uh, mine's an eight inch, so he's got a, a bit more aperture than I do. And instead of having the camera on the front like he does, I have a DSLR on the back. So it's just a standard Canon non-modified uh, T3i. And how how far man I I don't have phases of the moon handy but how far away are we to a full moon about two uh, days pretty close yeah days. so it's if you can bring us some Terminator action that would be great yeah. we we uh, just passed correct. perigee uh, we just passed perigee two hours ago and I know the full moon is forty eight hours after perigee this time so so it's like the two. opposite of a super moon it's it's not quite a super moon it depends where you where you want to fall the the definition is kind of uh, not really well defined I, I usually say a super moon is perigee within 24 hours of a full moon which we don't have the last three were but yeah. if you look around the internet it's uh, it, there there's kind of, it's kind of mysterious what the definition of an actual super moon because a full moon in perigee are only instants in time when they occur. Uh. So Ronald uh, Ronald Minch asks, what do each of you do when the moon is up? Does it affect your viewing? I view the moon. Yes. <laughs> it, it, it affects your yeah. viewing. Yeah. I, I, there's a lot of astronomers that just don't. They just don't even go out. They just I like, viewing, it. I like observing the moon, though. I really well, like it. One of the reasons why I got a narrow band filter was so I can do do it during the moon. So um, hopefully, once I figure out how to use it, I'll. Um, uh, I'll be able to get some shots during uh, during the moon. And that so does help. Yeah, so we're just on the moon right now, and I'm just going to leave it on the moon here. And I know, David, you know this uh, this moon well, and Mark's view is just terrific. I mean, just look at that uh, yeah, we're, the detail. We're looking, as we're going toward full, you don't quite see all the craters and mountains and things in profile. You're seeing the sun is almost directly overhead for that earthward-facing side of the moon. So every uh, a lot of the craters they they don't quite stand out as well where you get them. The best time is right around first or last quarter when things are in profile, and then you start seeing things casting shadows. It can look actually quite dramatic. I always like when you see on the Terminator the moon, where you see mountains and peaks and the craters and the rims starting to catch the sunlight where the floors of them are still in darkness. I think is kind of cool. In in each lunation of the moon, I mean we've got that one face that's turned perpetually toward us, but it's each each uh, phase angle of the moon looks slightly different if you look at a lot of the did, did you say lunation? Yeah, like the the synodic period of 29.5 days. Luna I've never heard that word. Lunation. The, the, it's different the from libration. Yeah. 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 Uh, lunation is is the period of uh, well if you're talking of a synodic month it's the time it takes the moon to go from one phase to the same phase like full to full, new to new, first quarter to first quarter. Mm, okay. Because cool. if I say one month, somebody will tell me, well, a month isn't precisely one synodic period. So, and then you get into dr draconitic months and synodic months, and it just it gets more confusing. Vampiric <laughs> months. Vampiric <laughs> months. So, so, look, months. so this is a great one. So take a look at this image that Mark's got right up right now. You can see that crater, and that's a fairly fresh crater. I mean, fresh I, as in, you I, know, I tens of millions of years. I think that's pro pro Procleus, I think. I'd have to look at my... I've got my little guidebook here. It's easier than trying to Google and crash my computer. Yeah, uh, but you can see, so you can see how there's like rays of m material that's blasted out, and so you can tell that that's a newer crater on the surface of the moon. So some big object smashed into the moon and sprayed out this brighter ray material, and it just cascaded down in this big shape. And this is how astronomers can tell how old regions on the moon are. They look for parts of the moon that have more craters, less craters, and they can see how weathered those craters are. In fact, uh, there's a great gadget that, that uh, CosmoQuest has, uh, has got, which is the moon mappers. You can go on to moon mappers, and you get examples of craters, and you can, you can sort of map out where all the craters are in the, in the image, and then you can judge how old those craters are, and then all that data goes back to scientists, and they use that to figure out the age of the various surfaces on the moon. And so that'll tell us things like when were various, you know, periods of impact, uh, what, uh, you know, which parts of the, of the surface that we see, when were they, you know, created. 
Yeah, that is uh, Americrisium, Sea of Crises, right up there. It's the same area. That dark, flat plain that we're seeing up there, and that's Proclius is that crater. I believe I'm saying that right. Down at the bottom, that shiny-looking crater there. I believe that's one that's that's a site of a lot of what they call TLPs, transient lunar ph lunar phenomena. The people that observe the moon actually see like uh, brightening areas around that crater. It's it's very very. Uh, it's got a high albedo. Would be the technical way to say it. So uh, Terry Rhodes says, "Can we see the Delphinius Nova?" And uh, we absolutely can. In fact, I think this is what you've got, Gary, right? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. This is the there sky it is. that it's supposed to be in. Um, I haven't been able to figure out where it is, but what I'll do is I'll post this, and you're welcome to check it against star maps and figure out which one it is. Yeah, it's in there somewhere. <laughs> We're thinking it's at one right of center. Or I'm thinking it's at one right of center. It's it's right now. It's sitting about fifth magnitude, and it got up to about fourth magnitude a few days ago. I did see it with Binox Friday night. Yeah, and Corey Schmitz took a picture of it, and it was overwhelmingly bright compared to everything yeah. else in his field of view. Mm -hmm. So there was no question that it was a very very bright star. So so I think I you know that that feels right to this me as well that it's that, that one. But... Yeah, over on the, the right side. The uh, AAVSO had a post a few days ago saying uh, the American Association of Variable Star Observers saying that this was uh, in the top 30 for NOVA, for classic NOVA right now in brightness. It already made the top 30 all time. Oh, so, really? Of all time? Four, fourth yeah. magnitude's pretty bright. They were talking NOVA going off. This is in our galaxy. This isn't a supernova that we usually see off in other galaxies. But it, this is just a garden variety classic NOVA. But fourth What's magnitude the, is pretty bright. I mean, we we covered this on the on the weekly space hangout on Friday, but but for those who missed it, what causes a, a nova like this? This this is a massive like a it's got a companion star that's dumping in material onto its white dwarf companion, and it's just building up and building up and building up until it compresses to such a point that it just erupts into a into a classic nova. But this well, is a, Will we see a possible planetary nebula af out of it in 30,000 years or whatever? I, I suppose. Uh, I don't see why not. I mean, it, it's if this is a recurrent nova, it may do this like, I know T. Pixidus is a recurrent nova, and some of them do it over and over again. This one I don't think is recurrent because we've never seen it before. I know they're trying to track down a uh, distance for it right now. I was looking at the magnitude, and this is my own kind of armchair guesstimation of how far somebody asked me this. And I looked at how broad, how far other novas that had reached that fourth magnitude point, and they were about 1,000 to 1,500 light years away. So I'm guessing it's over 1,000 light years away, somewhere in that range. Uh, they haven't put an official estimate. I know they look at the light curve and how it fades out over time, and they can use intrinsic luminosity to tell how far away it is from that. So we've got a couple of requests here, and I think they're, they're ones that we've never seen. Um, so one is NGC 6210, the Turtle Nebula. This comes from Clive Rogers. And the other one is NGC 6572, the Blue Racquetball. So those both sound like... Uh, I've never heard of those. No, <laughs> neither have I. So those, those sound to me like uh, they're come planetary. Up. But uh, yeah. yeah, so I'm going to put them in the chat, Stuart, and then... Uh, okay. I also saw a request for M10 and M12, so I'll get those here in a little bit. 6210 was the first one? Yeah. Um, and... I think Stuart has M57 in there right now, right? Yeah, so let's, yeah. I'll, show, I'll show Stuart's M57. So we've got 6572 and 6210. And, uh, yeah, there, there's no way I'll get 6210. It's way too small. Is it really? Yeah, it's 0 0.3 by 0 0.2 arc minutes, uh, which is about, I think, uh, maybe, I, mean, I don't know, how. what's the size of M57? Um, let me look it up. Yeah, so it's about a tenth the size of what we're looking at right here. So it's teeny, teeny tiny. Yeah, yeah. Um, and what was the other one? Sixty-two ten and sixty-five seventy-two. Yeah. I mean, if we had a um, um, a really high magnitude scope, you can do it, but 6572. Yeah. Well, I'm going to show your uh, your. 6572 your is also is also similarly itty bitty. I won't be able to get it. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think who would be Mike Phillips would probably be the right person to do it because he's modified yeah. his monster telescope, which is good for planetary observing, 
for doing some deep sky stuff, and he's he's pretty well equipped, so Mike can join us at some point. Um, and maybe Corey, well, he's feel the fuse too big. Nah, but Corey won't yeah. be able to get it. Yeah, yeah, same problem that, that you've got. Uh, so this is the new camera too, right, Stuart? Correct. Yes, this is this is my new um, my new QSI camera. Uh, same oh, one that cool. Gary has. Uh, uh, pretty much exactly. Um, uh, he has a different filter wheel combination than I do, but um, uh, other than that, it's 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 the same. So I'm very happy with that. Although when I'm I'm just struggling a little bit with the acquisition software. Just and it's great acquisition software. I'm just not used to it. So I, I watched the broadcast when you guys had the QSI rep on last week. That was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was great to have him to have him join us. I, I noticed there was silence when somebody in the in the forum asked if there was any of those cameras under two thousand dollars, and they're just really <laughs> kind of <laughs> the broadcast. Well, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. it's. Yeah, no, the, this this is high end gear, for sure. I, hey, if if a rep from Canon wants to join us sometime and talk about the DSLRs, or you know, yeah. someone from uh, I don't know, S big Samsung wants to talk about their video <laughs> cameras, that'd be great. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, but uh, no, it'd be great. I would love for someone from Canon to come and talk about their DSLRs. They they've got a an, a camera. Purposely built for yes. for they got, can, yeah. they got Canon 60DA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the Tan, Tanja Sund has one, and she just does amazing work with it. Yeah, so I, I'll I'll see if I can take. If anyone knows anyone at Canon, that would be great. Put them in touch with me, and yeah. uh, and we have them join us and ans answer some questions and do some demos. Um, okay, cool. So this is M57, the Ring Nebula. Yeah, it's kind of cool. You can see the central star in there too. I've only ever seen it uh, looking visually at M57 uh, one time through. Uh, the scope up at the Stewart Observatory once. Right. Now, Thad has, has schooled us week after week on this, which is that that central star is not actually the white dwarf from the from the planetary nebula. So it's... Interesting. Yeah. So it's in front or behind, but it's just perfectly lined up. But it doesn't yeah. happen to oh, be... Oh, it's, it's, it's just an optical alignment. Yeah. Correct. Right. Yeah. But it's not the white dwarf. And this then is, in... This... This is a star party favorite. It always, I always tell people it looks kind of like a ghost of a donut. Kind yeah, of. it, it, it would have been better had I had my color camera because it, it, you can get some nice color out of this with the with the DSLR. But alas, that's dead. <laughs> the camera's dead. Well, the the camera's not dead. It's just my there's the connector that goes from mm. that connects it from the camera to the computer that got loose and busted. Right. So. Oh well. That looks terrific. Okay, I'm gonna move to uh, to Gary's view here. Mark, you're, you've gone black. Yeah, my uh, program crashed real quick. Um, oh, okay, all right, all right. Uh, wow, that's great, Gary. This is our perennial favorite uh, M16, the Eagle. Nice. Okay, it's a Pillars and of Creation the, uh, nebula. Pillars of Creation, right there. That's amazing that you can get that. That's too cool. Yeah. I, I'm thrilled. Yeah, just terrific. Yeah, I mean, it even looks somewhat like the Hubble photo where you you, you can see the the outline of the same shape. Yeah, yep. and you can see that the uh, Hubble shows this connector, if you can call it that, between the two arms. Yeah. yeah. And so this is more. a traditional star-forming nebula, and uh, you know you can see the those dark uh, those dark parts in it. The view are the are the places where new stars are being formed. Just, just amazing. Our sun probably formed in something like that billions of years ago. Yeah, uh, Pamela. You know, in astronomy cast, Pamela likes to give us this example, right? If you get a bunch of nebulae, there's, there's this one, which is a great example of, of sort of when our sun first formed in this stellar neighborhood. But then you look at something like the Hyades cluster, where, uh, you know, things are, or sort of the, per, uh, sort of the, um, the Pleiades, Pleiades, where, yeah, where the where the stars are still really close together and still some nebulosity, and that's that's sort of the next stage. And you look at the Hyades, and then things are a lot further apart and starting to drift away. And now we have no way to know we're, sort of which stars we were. Which one? With. You know, you know, I I can't. I think it's M67. That I remember writing an article years ago about they they think there was some reason to believe they think that might have been like our sibling stars might have. Of, uh, like the metallicity is very close to the same. It's in Cancer, in constellation Cancer. Yeah. In the open cluster M67. Uh, so Eric Briggs says that I understand the Nova is less than a degree away from NGC 6905, the Blue Flash Nebula. 
I was looking at the the star chart. Yeah, it is very close to that same NGC. And so less than a degree, so we should be able to see it. Uh, but we're definitely not, you know, in it's, in Gary's field of view. But it's, it, you know, it's it's like right between the constellations Delphinus and Sagittarius. It's technically in inside the border of Delphinus, the dolphin, but it's very close to the upper border of uh, Volpecula and Sagittarius as well. Uh, Wayne W. says, yes, that was me. I finally bought the, the ATIC 383L plus monochrome CCD camera with Kodak KAF 8300, <laughs> which was 1900 bucks, so okay. below two grand. Yeah, yeah it's, the, it's the same chip that Gary and I have, and um, I'm sure it's fun. Yeah, no, it sounds yep. fantastic. Um, so uh, Kit Kat King is asking for M63. Is that up? M63. The sunflower. Take, take a look. Yeah. I'm trying to think what constellation it's in. This is uh, great. Yeah, that's that's up. I can. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm in the middle of imaging something else, but I, I'll put that on my list. Sure. And yeah. Kit Kat King has has provided. This is great. Like specific, uh, really specific information. This is terrific. <laughs> I'm just going to add the coordinates and stuff, so so these uh, people I, know uh, their sky. Yeah, my my mount's smart enough to know where M63 is. If, is as long as it, as long as it's smart enough to know that it's not behind my house. We'll see in a minute. <laughs> Irv is pointing at the ground. That's Irv is pointing. No, it's it's in the it's it's up by the Big Dipper somewhere. All right, so I've moved to your next image, Stuart, and this looks like the uh, dumbbell nebula. Correct. This is the Dumbbell Nebula in spectacular gray. Um, normally, it's uh, uh, sort of greenish blue on the outs in the inside and red on the outside. Uh, this is just a, a three-minute luminance um, uh, of it. But this is another uh, planetary nebula. Oh, uh, it looks, but it looks yeah. great. I mean, you can really see the subtle gray in it. And I think, from what I understand, this one, the star, is the white dwarf. The central star. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, you can you, kind of see one in there. Yeah, I, I mean, I can see it on my screen. Um, yeah. Uh, and my, the Google compression may have noised it up a bit. Well, this is one of the cool things that they've added. They've turned things into uh, 720p now. So if you're just watching this on regular old 360 or 480, you can now watch this in 720, which is fantastic. For us, it's a really big improvement because we're just getting a lot more detail in, in what we're broadcasting. Yeah, M M27 is in Volpec Chilla too, so it's not awful far away from from the supernova we were talking about. It's in the same general area of the Southern Triangle, the like, Summer Triangle. Um, okay, oh, and Mark, oh, we lost you again, Mark. That view of the Terminator was fantastic. Too bad. Okay, I'm going to move over to Gary's view. Is that a, this okay. is... M5? Uh, uh, M10. Tom M McVeigh requested this. He requested one? both M10 and M12, so I thought I would pop those up. And that's M10. Yeah, it looks like a globular. And here it is in my full field of view. Yeah. It's definitely a smaller globular than than the. Uh, yeah, it's not. It's not quite as as tightly packed as like M13 or any of the Omega yeah. Omega Centauri or any yeah. of those. Um, let's see. Ron Delvo says, I've got a Canon 40D modded. And a lot of people have that same thing. Uh, RJ Basque, yeah, we did have a stupid moon. I said it right at the beginning. <laughs> so, <laughs> But actually, hey. Mark is giving us just a terrific view of the moon. I, I love it. Hey, no moon, no eclipses. <laughs> um... My acquisition software just crashed, so I'm uh, I'll be stuck on this for a little bit. Oh, okay. And I think Mark has crashed as well. So, so I'm going to take a second then and talk about this new thing that I really love, which is the Kerbal Space Program. So, have you have you played this, David? No, I haven't. I saw you talking about it on Google Plus. Oh, oh, what a great game! Uh, so it's it's these little aliens, and they are like working on this space program and they're totally willing to you know risk everything no matter how crazy your mission is it's a really <laughs> realistic Newtonian's uh, Newtonian physics engine oh, and cool. yeah and I just love it and so um, man I don't know if I can even I could probably even show a launch um, 
Oh yeah, um, yeah, and and the physics are great. And so we go like, we spent all day. Me, my son, my daughter. We spent all day just making the rocket get into <laughs> orbit. That that is really hard. And and so didn't realize. So so by the end of it, right, my son and I are talking, and he's like. Uh, Okay, Dad. We need to make sure that we trim and increase your delta v, so that when you hit apogee, you've got enough, you know, ground speed that you're actually able to go into orbit. And and I'm understanding him, and we're just you having see, this conversation about about launching rockets. It's you so see great. What kind, of, what kind of learning curve NASA had early on? And I mean, it was even hard for them. Uh, a lot of the early lunar probes just crashed into the moon because they couldn't uh, do lunar insertion. On the very early ones. Yeah. What's, what's the name of the program? It's called the Kerbal Space Program. And you posted it on your stream? Yeah, I posted just sort of a rant about it, but I will, I will, yeah. let me see if I can make a... Yeah, I didn't I, see that. I will, I will launch a rocket, so you can kind of see. I'll build a rocket and launch a rocket if, if, if we're going to lose people here. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm back to imaging. So Are you I, back? Okay. Yeah, and I've got, well, um, this is M12. It looks like the one I just had, but... <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, no, and, globulars never get old. Globulars and Mark's got a new globular, too. Yeah, so uh, this is M13 here. This is a, a short 15-second exposure in my white zone uh, light pollution. That's Yeah, that's a classic in Hercules. That's another Star Party favorite. Probably one of the better ones in the Northern Hemisphere. I like M3, too. It's probably one of the best ones I like to show people. So would it kill you to know that I can see that with my eyes? Yes. A little bit. Oh, really? Yeah. I can see yeah. it with Binox. Yeah, if it's really dark, like if it's really dark and I'm and I'm outside, you can see this little hazy spot... Well, you, you can see you can see you can see with your eyes on the three days that you don't have clouds and rain. Yes, of course. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. Um, I can and, see I mean, Andro in Andromeda M31 naked eye. Oh yeah, and, you can absolutely in, see Andromeda. In the, in the Orion Nebula, you can see naked eye. Yeah. In uh, M44 in Cancer, that's bright enough. To... You got to figure Charles Messier, his optics had to have been very bad if he mistook a lot of these objects for comets. Like, yeah. say, the Pleiades, I, I could never figure out why did the Pleiades make his list as M45, just maybe for completion, I don't know. But, uh, but And then he missed things like the double cluster up between Perseus and Cassiopeia. Well, we were joking about that, yeah, that there must be some series of objects that he just kept going, I found a comet! Oh, no, yeah. wait, it's not, but he, for some yeah. reason, chose not to put them in his, in his uh, yeah. list. He had, he had no idea what he was looking at. This was in the 18th century, so he just kind yeah. of... its uh, The Messier catalog became a hodgepodge of just nebula, planetary nebula, open neb or clusters, just whatever whatever he was mistaking for comets okay, at the time. Okay, well, I wait for a new object from Stuart. Let me just give, show you this. Sorry. It's all right, it's no problem. 38, 37 seconds left on all my... All right, so, here, so here's me, okay? I'm going to go to my... Oh, you're going to do that. Yeah, I'm going to do it. So I'm going to go to the, the rocket facility... There we go. I will build a really quick little rocket here. So let's see. That looks like the VAB at KSC. Yeah, so there's my capsule. And then I'll build a propulsion system. So we'll put, uh, oh, that one. And then I'll build a rocket. Use this guy. So you're, you're going to get me into this, and I just don't need any more time. So now I'm going to go to the launch <laughs> pad. Better work. All right, so there's my rocket. So I'm going to throttle up my rocket. So you can see down here, right down here, this is where the throttle is. So you just, so my rocket's fully throttled up. That's like a one stager. It's, it's, yeah, it's not even. Again, I'm going to launch it. So now the trick is that I need to keep it. So you can see my uh, altitude is at the top there. And you can see my, yep. my surface, my, my velocity from the surface. I'm sorry I'm yelling because it's really loud That's in okay. my ears. Um, <laughs> right? And so uh, you can see the little Kerbal there guy, right? He's really kind of enjoying it. He's, he's getting some Gs, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's all right. And then I'm going to, so I'm about 5,000 meters now. You see I've almost used up all my fuel. So I'm going to turn. You're starting to see the curve of the Earth there. Yeah. There. So that's it. I've run out of fuel. So this was this was not a rocket designed for a long launch. So I'll show you the orbit map here. So this is his trajectory, his expected trajectory. So he's going to apogee. Yeah, it's like yeah, it's like, yeah, at, it's yeah he's going to apogee at thirteen thousand uh, meters. He's doing and, like John Glenn. And he's going to crash into the water. Now <laughs> I I didn't give him anything that he could use to get himself out of this. Uh, so he's he's done. 
Yeah. So that's, that's uh, yeah. It's about what you're going to get out of a one stage system anyway. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, and I've just crossed Apogee, and now I'm on my way back down, and I'll show you sort of the <laughs> spacecraft. Uh, yeah. That's kind of cool. Yeah. And so, I mean, you can build multi-stage rockets and land lunar landers and space stations and uh, Mars rovers, and you can land things on the moon, and then you can bring them back to Earth, and people have built single stage to orbit. Uh, there's also space planes. Anyway, enough rant. I, Very cool. I, I really like this game. Thank you for yeah. destroying what remains of my free time. Yeah. I gotta say, that'll yeah. totally. You'll never see another post from me on Universe today because I'll be playing this too much. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, you know, I I think we should we should try and simulate every launch within the Kerbal Space Program. So we'll, uh, you know, when there's a a new that could be Falcon an interesting 9, tool. Yeah, yeah we'll, that, we'll, we, we could use it for a simulator. Yeah. We'll show a demo of uh, of it. Yeah. Uh oh, Gary's got clouds. Uh, yep. I was trying to do Andromeda. That looks kind of cool, though. And I got some clouds off to my east. They're moving in, but at least we have that. This that actually our, looks kind of cool. This is not our night. No. Nope. Somewhere in the northern hemisphere. Yeah. Yeah, that does look really great, though. I'm impressed that you recognize those were clouds. Yeah. What? Or do you need to clean you, your telescope? You, <laughs> yeah. No, but you you can see because you did like a like a what a sixty second exposure and you can see yeah, the clouds that's a 60 are, second, yeah. yeah are smearing through your your image there. So you can see the satellite galaxy off to the side there, M thirty one too. It's weird that it really it kind of really overexposes the clouds and then you don't yeah. see the. But I'll bet you are you doing a longer exposure? No. But they're they're moving this direction, so it's only going to get worse. M M31 visually is a big structure, but it, it the least little bit of light pollution just knocks it right down. It's actually bigger than the full moon, the the extent of the entire galaxy, but you yeah. just don't see it, it generally. In my field of view, I can't fit the whole thing. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. I see the angle it's at corner to corner. I still lose pieces on the end. Yeah, yeah, and you can definitely see that with the uh, with the unaided eye here. Yeah, that's another star party favorite. Uh, yeah, Dusty Reitwin recommends that I had a parachute. Yeah, I, uh, I I have played around with parachutes, and it's great. You can do, like I said, multi-stages in Kerbal. You can hook up parachutes if you need these guys back. It's extra weight, though. That's so, kind of cool. You know, it sort of makes it. Uh, yeah, I, in fact, you know, we, we were able to put a put a guy into solar orbit. And that was, you know... I, Is I, he I still could, there? It's still there, yeah. He's, we just <laughs> left him there. I mean, who knows if we can ever meet with him and bring him back. So he's he's a good guy. Um, Sorry, Nick, I'm so slow. Nick Rose says, and Mark, you can move to another object. Have you you're st have you moved? Uh, I'm you're working on moving to something else. I think okay, you're on 13 <laughs> right. right now. It's kind of cool. Uh, Nick Rose says the dark sky map says I'm in a red white zone, but I can see magnitude 4.8 and slightly five. Why? Hmm. You you know I I think when you when you look at those maps I think there may be pockets of say like uh, another shade within another one if that makes any sense that there may still be like restricted areas like say in my backyard I'm blocked in enough from the street lights I actually requested we get the house on this side of the street because it's against the woods so it's darker back here so even though we're in a green zone maybe it we might have shades of blue <laughs> yeah <laughs> same for me sense. I can go a little sort of a few blocks away and away from the street lights is a big open field and I can go into that and then it's really dark. When, when I, I was in see most of the Big Dipper and the Summer Triangle and that's about it. Wow. When when I was in Vegas waiting for our, our uh, taxi back to the airport, I actually did a, a estimation of the sky there from the strip and I could see maybe the belt of Orion and Jupiter and Saturn but I couldn't see much else other. I think I could see down to Second magnitude, so that's probably the most light polluted place in the world on Las Vegas Strip. So. Okay. Uh, well, I'm gonna move there. back to Mark's view here. Almost there. <laughs> but this is this is great. I mean, this is one of the first objects that I was able to uh, to pull into my telescope, M13. So this is a this is yes. a globular cluster, the great globular cluster in in Hercules. And this is these are these ancient relics from the almost the Big Bang. I mean, these objects are old. In fact, yeah. astronomers originally, when they did some estimations of the age of these 
these clusters, they found that the clusters were older than their estimates for the age of the universe, which of yeah. course was really weird. I remember that back in the 90s, that actually was was kind of a paradox where they were trying to figure out why these we were apparently seeing objects older than, than the universe, and it was just the fact we hadn't really pegged down the age of the universe very well yet. Um, yeah, and so obviously it was just a matter of, yeah, as you say, you know, getting a more accurate version of, you know, understanding of the age of the universe and a more accurate understanding of the, uh, yeah, I, of the, um, I remember as a kid, the stars in them. They, they would say that the universe is 15 billion years old, plus or minus 50%. So <laughs> thing, that means the universe could be anywhere from 7 or 8 billion years old all the way up to over 20 billion years old. So it just means they, they didn't have it pegged down. We've got it pegged down right now within about 100 million years, but 13.7, yeah. 13.8 billion plus or minus 100 million years. So. Um, wh whoever wanted M63 is going to have to look behind my daughter's bedroom window because it's going right <laughs> through my house. Sorry. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're, but this looks like the veil? Correct. This is the veil. And, I, and I, I took three images of this. I was really fighting with it. I have, I have a lot of gradient. I got a lot of light pollution tonight. And um, uh, this is really the, the best I can do. Um, uh, now Stuart, how wide yeah. is your field? Uh, mine is about, uh, uh, I think, like 90 by 60 arc minutes, something like that. Okay, so that's like yeah. a like like a, a degree by a degree and a half or something like that. Yeah, that's something like that. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's like three mo full moons across by yeah, two high. Yeah, yeah, so, something yeah. like that. Yeah, you can put about six full moons in that frame. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and that's Gary can do about about the same or a little more. Just about the same. Yeah, yeah. sixty yeah. by ninety. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it might be a little, might be a little smaller. Cause I know Gary's field view is a little bigger, but my, you know, my scope's a lot smaller than his. So. And so this is great. This is this is a remnant of a supernova that's ex that exploded several thousand years ago, and it's this. <laughs> You know, think about the Death Star. When the Death Star blew up, right, you get this ring of material that comes out of the of the Death Star and sort of drifts away in space. And it's this, you know, this is what this looked like. You know, is there's this great ring of material. And in fact, this is one portion of it. This is what the Western Veil, Eastern Veil. Uh, this is the uh, this is the Eastern. Yeah, so the eastern and there's the western veil and there's just portions of this supernova chunks just floating out in space, just drifting away from the original explosion. And so in, in the future, we're going to see something like Betelgeuse or Eta Carina or Arcturus go off and you're going to get the same thing. You're going to get this, this puff ring in the sky that will expand over hundreds of, of years, thousands of years until it just sort of dissipates into the background of space. This is one of those objects too that you you almost would be impossible to see visually with the naked, with the unaided eye. I've never seen it. The unaided, maybe at a really dark site, you might be able to pick out parts of it. No, and I mean you really need to have that that view into hydrogen alpha yeah. to really yeah. pick it up. So, uh, but great, this is great, Stuart. I yeah. mean, this is a lot more sensitivity. You can really see sort of up in the upper left hand corner just these right. that nodding and, you know. Yeah, the, and, and just to give you an idea, I mean, this is this is heavily stretched. Um, you know, if you when I first downloaded, I, I didn't even know it was there. You know, so I had to open it up and then stretch it, and then uh, so it's a it's very very dim. You know, and the only reason why I knew it was there that I knew it was supposed to, where it was supposed to be is because I knew that my mount would point to where it needed to go. You know, yeah. but you know, I, I sort of was hoping it's like, do I really have it or do I not? You know, let me let me stretch it out and see it. Oh, that's great. I'm going to go back to uh, to Gary's view. Um, this is M. Hang on, M17, the Swan. Swan. I'm trying to do too many things at once. <laughs> oh, that, cool. I can zoom in and get a little detail here. This is the lobster, as we have yeah, ended the up lobster. Calling it. Oh, neat. I never heard it called that. Yeah, I kind of. Oh, I see the tail. I see what you're talking about. Yeah, Omega and Nebula too, right? Yeah, I think so. So this is another example of this star forming uh, region. Has someone been able to? So Will Common asks, has someone been able to ID the origin point of the Veil supernova? No, that's a great question. Never, so I never, think never, the Veil never. was was a type two supernova, and the kind that just detonate. So they just blow themselves apart, and there's nothing left. Yeah, that that wouldn't have been in. 
That would have had to have been probably thousands of years ago. I don't think there's any historical record of it. I could be wrong. Yeah, it was about 6,000 years ago, I think. Let me see. It's, it's ironic we haven't had a visual supernova in our galaxy since um, the invention of the telescope. I think Tycho's, or, uh, Tycho's supernova back in 16, 16th century was the last one. Yeah, Tycho wrecked it for all of us. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. well, the crab, I mean, the Crab Nebula is a pretty recent one, but the, uh, so the veil blew up uh, five to 8,000 years ago, and it's about 1,400 light years away. I think there might have been some, some ancient records that they think might be connected to it, but they're not conclusive. That one sounds very familiar. I think yeah. there's one in Cassiopeia A, I believe, was one, too, that they'd been trying to connect it up with different uh, historical, like, really ancient records. But. Yeah, and now it's filled up about three degrees in diameter. Yeah. So it's it's too big to fit in any one telescope I know, view. I know with the Crab Nebula, they've, taken a, uh, they've actually taken images over the past century where you can see the animation of it expanding. You can actually wow. see from, like, 1950s up to now they've actually done an animation where you can see it has changed. Most of these objects don't change in our lifetimes, but some of the uh, Crab Nebula is pretty recent because that went off in 1066, I believe it was. Wayne, uh, Wayne W. says, are you using a sky glow filter for pollution? Is anybody using a sky glow filter? No. No? no I'm just... I've, I've used them. I'm not using them now. Yeah, I, I'm not either. I just, um, I just bring it over to Photoshop and move the black point over, and that sort of is a quickie get rid of sky glow trick. I have um, a uh, one of the clip and light pollution filters, but it kind of turns everything as bluish green. Oh, we don't like that. Yeah. Yeah, Fraser always complained about my blue moon. Yeah. <laughs> Your blue Saturn. Your blue moon is fine. Your blue Saturn. <laughs> yeah, and the, blue, and the purple Venus you didn't you didn't like either. So. No, well, a purple Venus I can dig that, but yeah. no. no. Uh, and so what, we've moved now to another famous nebula? Uh, mine, yes. This is the Homer Borg? It's um, the Borg nebula, yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, this is M8, the lagoon. And I think I've flipped, the scope has flipped since the last yeah. few weeks. So let me see if I can. This one, uh, I believe this is in Sagittarius. You can pick this there, up. The there's our Homer. It's pretty easy. Yeah. There it yeah, is. Yeah, there's our oh, Borg cool. Homer. But this one zooms in really nice. There's all kinds of yeah. neat little details. Summer is really the time of nebula. This is this is it's so funny. So when we're in the summer, we're just like nebula after nebula. When we're in the spring, it's mostly galaxies. You've got that. You've got that plane of Sagittarius and everything. Sagittarius through Cygnus overhead. So you've got uh, the plane of the galaxy where there's a lot of it's just strewn with a lot of objects. A lot of stuff going on there. Ooh, look, something's coming out of his nose. It must be space balls. <laughs> <laughs> space debris. There goes the planet. Although it's, it's kind of too bad the core of our galaxy is down on the horizon for us up here in the northern hemisphere. Down, down under, they get a really much better view of it. Oh, a yeah. lot of it's obscured by dust, but still, you, you don't really realize how awesome seeing the whole Milky Way is until you can see the, the southern extension of it. Yeah. I guess someone living on the equator. You're pretty close to the equator. Yeah, we're 28 degrees north here. So I, I've been down south three, four... Ecuador, Peru, mm -hmm. New Zealand, Australia, but I always I only add my binoculars though, so I never had a telescope with me. Uh, I've got a request for Alberio, which I don't know if we're gonna have enough time. I'm not sure where. I think I, I can see people struggling with telescopes tonight. Yeah. It's in Cygnus, so that's a, yeah. another store party favorite. Yeah. Or double. I believe it's an optical double though too. It's it's one that they're they're just off. I've, uh, I've asked that about it. He says he's he's they're not sure. And yeah. I normally would get it, but I'm not color tonight, so it, yeah. you know. Let me see if I can grab it. Oh, that'd be great, Mark. Yeah, that's a virio is kind of cool. Even through binoculars, you can see it's it's one of the yeah better col color doubles. It's and that said, it was a visual knot. So in this case, it's it they're not actually I, orbiting one I've, another, right? I've heard that before too. Where he was saying it was inconclusive that it's it's uh if it is if they are gravitationally bound or I know astronomers look at these stars with double stars to see if they have the same proper motion if they're moving the same direction through the sky or if one's going this way and one's going that way then they know they're not gravitationally bound. But if they are bound, they're probably like on a couple hundred year orbit they're not closely bound but to be that far apart yeah to split them they're what 
they're like 20 arc minutes, 30 arc minutes, something like that. Apart. Now, is that your Gary? You've got a little finger for your avatar. Is that did that come from this nebula? Like, like I see a spot in there that looks very fingery. What? Right in the middle. <laughs> so you know your avatar, Gary. You have the you have you have a nebula giving oh, you my, the finger. Oh my avatar! Yes, yeah, yes. in Google Plus. And, yeah. uh, and it looks like that's it, right? Sort of where the mouth is of home. Oh, no, actually that's in Karina. We can't see it from here. Um, oh, okay, okay. It's down I, just, atmosphere, yeah. I just like that because I figure it's what the universe thinks of us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay, move to Stuart's view. Stuart has got the uh, satellite nebula. Yes. Yeah, I see a satellite uh, going through the frame. Yeah, that, I, I, kind of, I, I could have taken another shot, but I kind of liked it because it, it gives, gives you an idea of... Some of the the stuff that you know as amateurs have to deal with when we when we see these things, you know, when yeah. we're doing these things, because yes. you know satellites and airplanes and stuff go through our fields of view all the time, and this this would be uh, an example of um, of you know one such image. If I was this is M101, so. Uh, you know, normally, let's say this is just a three-minute image. Let's say I was taking a ten-minute image of this, and you go, "Oh crap, the image is is ruined." Well, it's really not because you can have software that can take and remove that line. I'm here. I'm I'm making hand motions. You can't see me, but can, <laughs> yeah. but can remove the line um, quite easily. And so it would be a perfectly good, um, perfectly good. Uh, um, a sub image uh, of the of the whole thing, but I, but I like this in that you can actually see it's the face that is face on. You can see some of the spiral arms, and um, that's one of my you favorites. See, yeah, you can see some of the star forming regions up there, like around the twelve ten o'clock, twelve o'clock, where there's like new regions of star formation up there too. Yeah, it really looks like this star, this galaxy has been harassed at some point in the past because it's very lopsided. <laughs> You can see that it's got more spirally armness on the bottom and less on the on the top. Yeah, I, I can tell you guys on the west coast that you can in the summertime that the sun is just set because when you're imaging, you're still getting satellite trails through the, the all the low Earth orbiting satellites are still illuminated. Yeah, well, the ones in geosync are probably always illuminated. We've had a bunch of just terrific uh, space station passes. Like I'm getting. Every day I'm getting another... You're at a higher latitude, yeah, so you get them uh, like UK does too. UK up around 50 north, they, they can get they can get four or five passes in one night sometimes, in the summertime, certain times a year. We get, we get a couple of weeks, so I'm always out watching for it. All right, I have Elberio just going to screen share it here real quick. We're ready. Yep, that's it. Oh, great. I like double stars. It's a star party. It's good when you're doing a star party from a really light polluted area, like from downtown Tampa or something like that. Double stars will still kind of punch through. Nothing oh, you can show them to people. That is fantastic, Mark. I mean, you get the color, too. Yeah. yeah. I figured since I didn't have the light pollution filter in and I've got the DSLR, I might as well do something with some color on it. Yeah. If if you have a chance, do the ring also, so you can see the color of the ring. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and pop over there right now. I mean, you you know, it's much uh, much easier for you to get a star, which is so bright and such a, a point source, right, compared to the ring nebula, which is going to be fairly fairly washed out. You you've done it before, though, I think. Yeah, it does. Uh, it's, it it's, doesn't it's, look too bad from here. It's pretty bright. I mean, he 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 could do it. Thanks for your confidence, Stuart. Yeah, no, no worries. <laughs> you can do it. Yeah, th this is a good I'm, double star here for amateurs. I, I'm trying. So I might be this. I'm trying something I've never done before for the VSP. It's the Iris Nebula, and I have no idea whether <laughs> it'll 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 come out or not. But we'll we'll see. I'm gonna go to Gary's view. I am seeing a propeller. That's it. This is oh, our cool. infamous propeller nebula. That's awesome. Figured I'd get things that I can know I can have look good. <laughs> and no clouds moving through it. What, what, yes. what constellate? Where where about is that in the sky? What constellation? Uh, that is up Cygnus. Okay. It's okay. real close to the North American nebula. 
Okay, yeah, it was right in the head of Cygnus. Like around Deneb in that area. I'm, I'm, I amaze myself that I know these things. <laughs> I don't know anything about this. You just pick it up over time. You do. You really do. Well, I mean, it's it's actually that's actually not a joke because with a lot of people with go to uh, uh, mounts, yeah, yeah. You, you just sort of say, "I want to see this." You go blah blah blah, and mount slews to it, and, and somebody will ask you what constellation it is. And you go, oh, oh. <laughs> it's, it's like phone numbers now with with uh, mobile phones, right? Like, what's I, your phone? I don't know. I, I I'm I'm glad I learned how to star hop from back when the 70s and 80s prior to go tos. I mean, I have a go to, and I use go to mounts too. But when the batteries die or freeze up or whatever, I I can still star hop to a lot of objects. Star right, party I, favorites. Anyway. Okay, well, we're waiting for another object. I'm uh, I'm gonna launch another rocket here. Sorry. So now I've got a two stager. <laughs> so here we go. Oh, cool. Yeah. Let's see. All right, here we go. So this is my two stage simple rocket. All right, and up we go. And so you can see on the left hand side, I've got the, the various stages. All right, stay on target. All right, and then it's going to run out of fuel. It's just going to take a little while. We'll let it. We'll just let it go in the background. <laughs> that should reach orbit. We'll see that. Yeah. Oh, this this one will reach orbit if I can pilot you have it. To, you have to do what they call a dog leg maneuver to reach a highly inclined orbit. <laughs> Let's see, I'll let it go a little. It's almost out of fuel on the first stage. I don't know if you can hear. No. Does it make noise? Yeah, it makes noise if the rocket's going off. All right, so you can see. Okay, and now I'm going to... Oh, I see. It's so Mark's attached. got the M57 yeah. there, yeah. All right, so I'll, I'll tail it down now. So now I'll turn down the, and now I'm going to see what my orbit is. That's the dog leg. <laughs> so. so my apogee is going to be, uh, that's not so good. Yeah, it looks like you're going to splash back down. Yeah. So now I can turn up the... It was just quick. No, there's no fins. Oh, I'm going down. All right. Let me raise myself up a bit here. Okay, I was able to get the iris, so I'm just going to stretch it real quick. This is going to be cool. Uh, you're going to love this. Just All right. Hold, hold the party open until I can get this process. Right. All right, we're ready. This will be the last object. Because otherwise, you're just, people are going to watch me kill another Kerbal. I know, I know, I know. Bring, bring the object or, I, or another Kerbal dies. Yeah. He's, he's, he's doomed regardless. I'm working on it. Working on it. Me too. I see Mark's got M57 with some Yeah, color. so here's my ring nebula uh, with uh, yeah, you can see you a know, bit of color my in. terrible skies. Oh, but you can still really see the, the colors in it. That's beautiful. Yeah. So visually through a telescope, it looks pretty much gray. <laughs> No, I've still I've I've killed another Kerbal. All right. And what have you got, Gary? This is North American Nebula. Nice. Is that the Gulf of Mexico there? This is the Gulf of Mexico. That I recognize, yeah, because that's that's iconic. You see that in a lot of yeah. This is uh, would be Florida, and going down into Mexico yep. and the Gulf. So, let's see. In California, I'd be probably right about here. It's like turned on its side, but uh, yeah, that that's a big object. That's about I don't know. That, eight that, ag the... that again is one I've never seen with the with the unaided eye. Maybe at a dark site, you might be able to pick out parts of it. But... Yeah, and this is um, just a, a quick learning about this stuff. Uh, I first put a tel uh, camera on an eight-inch scope that I had, and I put it on the back, so it's running at f10. Uh, eight inch, and I'm out at the star party, and I said, "Well, I'm going to take a picture of the North American Nebula," um, and I got probably this much of it. 
<laughs> so there wasn't there wasn't much to see. I could see a glowing sky, but now, uh, that, that was. It, is that Deneb right there in the frame, center of the frame? Uh, it's a good question. Or it might be off the side. But yeah, I'd have to look. Yeah, I know it's very, very nearby. Well, yeah, one but, of the stars in the summer triangle. But that was one of my biggest learning curves is just how big some of the stuff out there is. Uh, yeah. Wayne asked, do you have a designation uh, the, for the propeller nebula? DWB yeah. 111 is not in my Starry Night Pro. Yeah, database. we 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 looked for that. It's um, I remember, and we, yeah, it's not like it doesn't have an NGC number or anything like that. Um, it might be in the IC catalog or one yeah. of the other ones too. Uh, okay. And that is not Deneb. Deneb's about three fields of view. Okay. okay. Off of my frame. Okay, Gary. I mean, um, Fraser. Here you go. Iris Nebula. We've never seen this before. Ooh, something. Oh, nice. I think we have. I think we have seen it. Oh, we have. Okay. Yeah, but but that's okay. That's okay. No, no, no. I think Bill brought it uh, one week, but that's oh, terrific. Yeah. I, I mean, what's great about this is just all of the dark regions in it. It looks like you're just seeing the places where there are no stars, but the reality is is that the 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 dark it's, portions of the nebula are actually numb. blocking it. Yeah. Yeah. This is a three-minute exposure. I've been two by two. So I'm, where, where is this roughly? What constellation? Um, yeah. <laughs> or just, just even give me, give me the right big, ascension definition. Big Dippery in that area. Okay. Yeah, Polaris. Okay. Hey, it's in Cepheus. Cepheus, okay. Cepheus, yeah. It's big Dipper-esque. Dip, big, it's sort of in that area of the sky-ish. Oh, very cool. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I killed off another uh, Kerbal. But, but you know, they're making a valiant effort for uh, for the future <laughs> of Kerbal space life. And... I, I can put them into space if I put a little effort and time <laughs> into orbit. So, um, <laughs> Sterling, yeah, people are people are noting that I'm a little cavalier about the Kerbal. So perhaps I should be a little more careful before I'm put in charge of NASA. Also, <laughs> become an American. Um, okay, so I think we can wrap this up here. We've been going for an hour, so I I want to get one last view of Mark's uh, ring nebula because it's really great. That is great. I cannot wait for you to buy a nice property in the middle of Montana and take your telescope there. New Mexico. Montana's New too Mexico. far north. Yeah, all right. all right. I can show you some of the stuff I did while I was up uh, camping real quick, but it, I posted it to my Google Plus stream, anything I process, so if anybody's interested in seeing Well, go it. and add it, to the, add it to the event page as well. While sure, you're, sure. Yeah, and then post any of the pictures, so great. And I just popped this up, Fraser, to show my okay. field of view. Okay. Right. Uh, this purple box is what yeah, we're yeah. seeing, and Deneb is up here. Yeah, I see it. Yeah. yeah so it's just out, just outside the uh, the field of view for it. Yep. Terrific. Right along that plane of the galaxy. So yeah. Great. Lots okay. Well, uh, well, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Thanks for uh, thanks for all the astronomers. Oh, come on! Look at that. Now this is obviously not live. This is this yeah. Is... This is about an hour's worth of uh, data in Andromeda. Oh, that's fantastic. wow. Yeah, that's awesome. great. Great. All right. So, and I don't know what's happening this week. Uh, we'll definitely be doing the weekly space hangout on Friday. I'm not sure. Pamela is still on the road for this summer, so I'm not sure if she'll be back for Astronomy Cast tomorrow. Um, I'm assuming no. Uh, but uh, yeah. And so thanks again, everybody, for watching. Sorry we had some technical problems tonight. Um, but uh, no, it's good. It's good. And we're going to be coming back earlier now for all of you folks on the on the East Coast. So hopefully it'll make yeah. it easier. In the middle of winter, we start at 5. So it's just like prime time for you. All the rest of us haven't even eaten dinner yet. So. Yep. Awesome. Okay, well, hey, thanks, David. Thanks, Gary. I'm going to bed. Thanks, Mark. And thanks, I, the uh, Iris Nebula. <laughs> Thanks. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks, Good night, everybody. See you guys later.